Deanna Radulescu has seen it all and then some. Her backstory is not to be read lightly. It is fraught with experiences that few might survive. How she was able to move forward and shed the demons that enveloped her past is a story in itself. A human trafficking survivor, widow, former sea level executive, fashion designer, bodybuilder, skincare expert, Miss Chicago America Nation 2021, Radulescu epitomizes strength and resiliency, who shows all of us to be our best selves and be damned with the naysayers. Today, she champions other people's stories. She has a successful nationally syndicated show called the Label Free Podcast, which is dedicated to epic storytelling. This Chicagoan is also the head coach and founding partner of the Female Podcasters Network with over 2,000 members and an on-air personality on the top NBC affiliate news talk radio. Please welcome Deanna. <laughs> wow, that was quite the introduction. I don't even think you need to hear me talk anymore. <laughs> like, wow. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> You're welcome. Because you had strong women role models in your mom and your grandmother, and with your dad not being the most respectful man, your upbringing had to be quite volatile. <laughs> it was. Yeah, it was. When did you finally go out on your own? So I actually left the house at 17. Mm. Yeah. You didn't have the best role model for relationships, and it makes a young person quite vulnerable to nefarious individuals. What were those years like before you married your first husband? Oh, well, I mean, you got involved with the wrong kind of man, abusive. You know, obviously, I was passed around and got involved in human trafficking because that at one point he had broken into my house twice. He had abducted me and took me into the middle of the field, stabbed me. It was all kinds of crazy stuff. I think I almost lost my life that day. And even after all of that, it was familiar to me, right? Because I had that as an example growing up. When I had to take him to court, my mom forced me to call the police, file a police report, and I took him to court. I cried the whole time because I was like, oh my God, you know, it just was conflicting. Even though I knew it was wrong, it was conflicting because that was what I was used to. And so, yeah, not the greatest relationship experiences, but our past does not define us. It actually just gives us more wisdom and experience. So true. But it's not easy to get out of a bad relationship. That's usually when the worst happens. How did you take that first step? And did you feel safe when you did? Probably not. Um, I did. I mean, regardless you... of the decisions I made to stay in something like that, <clears throat> I'm a very strong woman, you know, and nothing really scares me. I mean, even to this day, I hate to say it and sound like so brazen, but I'll kick someone's ass. Like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn into like a little ninja and people will be like, holy crap. Because <laughs> I have the training. I'm a second degree black belt. I'm a former bodybuilder. So I have the skill set to protect myself. But um to change, to cut off that cord, because being in an abusive relationship is almost like an addiction, right? You're so used to that chaos and it's hard to get out of it. It really is. And so once you decide to get over that addiction, you know, cutting the cord for me, it was easy. I was like, okay, I'm done. I like, I remember I went 30 days not talking to him at all. And he finally called me after 30 days and I was just like, you know, I, I'm done. I did not want to go back at that point. So I worked on myself as well. You got to work on yourself to realize that you deserve better. That's not the end all. And I think that when women are in those situations, just like myself, you're manipulated to think that's all you that you deserve. They tell you, oh, nobody's going to love you. Nobody likes you. Oh, you're lucky if you to have me. And I remember like I had a conversation with this person after all that happened, he said that to me, I started laughing at him. I said, nobody loves me. 
Most people love me. What are you talking about? <laughs> I start laughing because those words, those manipulation, those manipulative words of that, like that, that d- d- didn't work on me anymore. Anymore. So <clears throat> I think that when women are in those situations, they have to decide I deserve better. Yeah. They beat you down till you're this high so that they can control you better. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and imagine just having that role model of your mom and your grandmother, did that kind of help you through that, get that courage to get out of that? Yeah, I guess. My grandma, my grandfather were married for over 50 years. Although my parents did not have the best relationship, I still was raised with good family values. Mm-hmm. And my mom was, she's still to this day, she's just like a very free-spirited, independent woman. It took her forever to get remarried. She just got remarried a couple of years ago, but for my whole life after my father left, she was, she never was with anyone. And so my mom is very independent. And I think because she was that way, and I had that example from being 16 to or like my adult life, you know, that was a good example for me. Sometimes it's really hard to, if you haven't worked on yourself to kind of find another person to connect with, because you end up choosing the same type of person for some reason, (laughs) or a lot of women do. (laughs) So you focus your efforts into bodybuilding. And what was it about that particular activity that had you hooked? I think that I'm actually an athlete by nature. I just got out of the shower before jumping in here because I was at the gym working out. I was just doing some interval training. But the discipline and every time I would get ready to compete, the level of growth that I experienced, and I know it's not the same for everybody because it's a very selfish sport. And a lot of people are very difficult to be around throughout their prep their prep cycle. But for me, over the course of 20 years, that's how long I competed, I learned to really embrace the prep time and just love it, you know, and I did not get cranky. I would just get a little tired. You know, I, you go out with people, you can't drink, you got to bring your cooler. So you have to be comfortable with like just being your own person. But I really enjoy the discipline of it and just taking a break from all the, it really makes you take stock of all the things that we should be grateful for. Like the good Mm -hmm. meals, like to taking the time and just like indulging in like chocolate or dessert. When you take such a long hiatus from all those things and you're eating so clean and living such a strict lifestyle, it really allows you to be more grateful for the things that you do have so that when you're done prepping, you can celebrate the life that most people don't realize that they should be celebrating every day. Wow. Tell me a little bit about your husband that got you involved in the business side of things. Uh, What was he like? And your businesses were quite successful and you got very savvy skills at it. (laughs) I am a businesswoman by nature. I did go to school for business, but I'm just naturally business savvy. Thank you for using that word. My late husband and I met at the gym. He was a big bodybuilder and larger than life. This huge man, 12 years older than me. So he was older. And at that time when I met him, I still was having daddy issues. So of course I attracted an older man and, you know, we complimented each other very well in the beginning was not the easiest he was. I mean, at the end of the day, he was a steroid addict and that's Mm -hmm. basically what killed him. He, He needed his third kidney transplant at the end. He had open heart surgery. He was, I mean, it was just terrible. He did not value the life that he had. And he had four daughters from a previous marriage. But when I met him, he was this larger than life man that, you know, he was still dating a lot of different women, lying, just playing that whole game that a lot of guys in that sport do. Of Ultimately, I changed my number. I had like cut off ties with him and he was very wealthy. He would t- he'd send me flowers. At one time he sent me a fur coat, sent me a <laughs> Rolex because I wouldn't talk to him. So he's sending me all these gifts because I wouldn't talk to him. And I'm like, I don't care how much money you have. I'm not dealing with that. You're not going to treat me this way. I'm not the kind of woman that's going to turn the other cheek while you go play around because you have all this money and think that you can do that. That's not for me. No, I've already been there, been there with an abusive man done that. I'm not doing that again. So finally he went to rehab a couple of times because he called it love and sex addiction. But I can say this for a fact because I've dated a lot of men that do steroids. 
there's something about taking all those hormones that make them very twisted in the head when it comes to love and sex. They want to try to get as many women as possible. They have crazy thoughts around sex and they will lie just to get what they want. And so he went to rehab twice before we got engaged. So after he did all that, he told me because of me, he is a better man, which is a great compliment, but he never stopped the steroids. And we had a great we were the ultimate power couple. We compliment each other while in business, but he was very controlling. I never was able, probably in our time together over 17 years, I probably had 10 days away from him. And wow. if I went to go have like a tea, you know, we had afternoon tea with my grandma, my sisters and my mom, I would come back to a huge fight. It wasn't like I could go and have fun with my family and come home and he'd be happy to see me. It was not... You know, and no, I don't think a lot of people realize that because on the outside, we look so great, right? Oh, yeah. look at this couple. They got it all, blah, blah, blah. And I just decided I'm not, I wasn't even going to try to do girlfriend things because it wasn't worth the fight. So mm. we continued to focus on our businesses. We ultimately had five at the end of the day. Our main one did 20 million in sales. It was in automotive. I doubled the size of the business with one contract, probably a year before he passed, Um and then we had an installation arm of the business that was here local in the Chicagoland area. And then we had three real estate holding companies. So yeah, and I managed all of those. I managed everything. So he was grooming me to take things over. And then he declined very quickly at the end. He was in the hospital for the last 30 days and that was it. But he wouldn't stop taking the steroids. He wouldn't stop mm -hmm. injecting. He wouldn't wow. stop. Yeah, I was administering dialysis for two and a half years and he still wouldn't stop. We'd fight about it all the time. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that's something that never gets talked about too much is that side of the steroid use. You hear yeah. a lot of the downside of it, but not that it's addictive like that. I think it's more of a mental addiction than mm -hmm. anything. You know, I think that there's a place for steroids like, you know, TRT, testosterone re replacement therapy for men. I think that's important. I think there's even hormone replacement therapy for women that is is very uh, helpful. But when you get into the sport of bodybuilding and the way that these men inject without any professional direction is really ultimately what kills them. They just are doing what they think they should do because they want to feel big and they're just the mentally addicted to it. If I don't take this shot, I'm going to flatten out. And so it's not a great place for anyone to be when they're taking that stuff. And of course, he met his ultimate competitor in you because you have, having taken bodybuilding and with your survival skills, you are not going to be messed with. <laughs> we had some pretty, uh, pretty crazy fights. I'm definitely one that holds her own. I will not, even in the first one, I would fight. Like that's probably what scared him and stopped him from <laughs> doing it because I was kicking him in the face. Like, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I mean, at least, you know, you're, you should fight for yourself regardless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you got into fashion the hard way. That to me it was quite a ballsy move that you made. The fashion industry, while it sells beauty and esteem and all of that, it's also very cutthroat and nasty. Yeah. Tell us oh, yeah. more about that experience. I just find well, it you can't see today because I usually I'm very dialed up, but I love fashion. I love clothes. I love shoes. I love everything about being a girl. I just love it. You know, I would never want to be anything but who I am. I had always told my late husband, I want to get into fashion. I didn't go to school for it. I did used to make my own clothes in high school. I sewed a lot. I would make alterations to my stuff. Always did all that. And so when he passed, I was like, okay, that's it. I'm going to find out how I can get into the fashion industry. And so I sought out a consulting company in Soho, New York, where that's where fashion like lives and breathes is in Soho. And that, you know, hindsight, I probably would have done more research, but I was spinning from him passing away. Well, where's my life going to go? You know, I was just like, my life was going everywhere. It was just crazy. It was a crazy time. And so I went, ended up signing a contract with them, investing in doing my first collection with them. It didn't go the right way, but I learned a lot with them though. So there was plus minuses, obviously with everything. And I was on the runway in Rhode Island and I was featured on their local news there for style week, which was awesome. The Boston Globe reporter was like, did a standing ovation for me. So that was very cool. I came back here to Chicago. I was a finalist for Cadillac Design Challenge for Style Chicago. 
And I had ended up doing two more co collections after that. And my last collection I did for, it was a fall of 2019. And I did it on the runway here where I did an event against human trafficking with six other Chicago-based designers. So it is a cutthroat industry. It was a lot more different than I thought it was going to be. And if I was to do it again, which you never know, I might, you know, 10 years from now, I'd be like, hey, I'm going to give this a try. I would do it completely different. I wouldn't do a whole collection. I would do a couple key pieces and I would do it all e-commerce. I wouldn't try to do the runway and I wouldn't try mm -hmm. to do all the fit models and all this, you know, old, old world of thinking of fashion because it's not like that anymore. Yeah. And that's why I like Christian Siriano because he... Well, to me, he made a name to me when he started dressing women that other designers refused to dress because they were huh. overweight and they weren't that fit model, like right. you said. So who are your favorite designers besides yourself? <laughs> favorite designers? You know, that's a good question. I feel like there's so many options out there. I mean, I love the classics, you know, but tasteful pieces from the classics like Chanel, like some of this crazy stuff they have is just, you know, I found a couple of pieces at Gucci the other day that I really liked, but then their other stuff, I'm like, whoa, that's just so off the wall. And I wear a lot of Versace. My fiance and I love Versace. We get a lot of pieces from there, but they're like staple pieces, like Versace jeans. I got leggings to work out in just like nice staple pieces that the only thing about you about name brand like that, those luxury brands is that the quality is so great. So if you're going to invest in something like that, invest in everyday pieces that you can wear all the time because that's going to last forever. And if something breaks, they warranty it, you know, mm. if, if, yeah, they do. We've had that experience. And so that's why you invest in the designer brands is because they do take care of you. Yeah. And that is something I remember way back when I was starting in the workplace right out of high school is the thing was to buy, spend a lot of money on maybe a couple of basics and then yeah. dress around it. And yes. you spend more money on those pants or that skirt, but your, ex oh, your yeah. accessory around it, your blouse or whatever could be a lot cheaper, but then the pant and that classic pant and skirt would last forever. Yeah. Yes, I totally agree. So when did you make that decision to start sharing your story because for many that is really terrifying especially the first time you do it and it's so difficult for most but when did you make that decision and and how was it that first time i first of all to find my voice at all after you know my life completely changed and i had to rebuild was very difficult I really started having to learn how to do my elevator pitch for myself with my clothing brand, right? And I was able to develop a great brand, very long lasting. People remember me for it. And that was a good start. But then after I was done with the you know, fashion, as I moved into segued into being a podcaster and originally started off as a, just a passion project, I was really tired of the labels that I carried on myself the labels that other people put on me. And I think everybody experiences this. And so for me, this was part of my growth, right? Growing from everything I've been through, growing into my new life. And it's terrifying. It's so scary to just really want to talk about your story and share it with people. But usually when you're vulnerable, that's when people love you the most is because you they can connect with you and they can find a place where they can relate and they actually appreciate you being brave because they're living kind of vicariously through, through you. And so as I've gone through this podcasting journey and I've opened up more and more and more, it's been like a huge weight has been lifted off my shoulders. It's like, there are no more skeletons in the closet. Everybody knows where the bodies are buried. That's it. Everyone. <laughs> You think you got a secret on me? You don't. It's it's all out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Another it. one of my guests said I wrote the book and she was a exotic dancer and a mom at the same time and married. <laughs> she said basically the same thing. Who are you going to shame after I've already told yeah. my story? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's very liberating. I think that there are people like you 
people like me, people that are like our other guests that we have on our shows that are tasked, they have a duty to share things they've been through. I think when you get that feeling to start sharing, that's like God or whoever you believe in your higher power telling you it's time because there are people out there that need to hear your message and hear your story. And so for me, and I'm sure for you, that the responses that I get from sharing stories of my guests have really helped others. That is so fulfilling in so many ways. And all we can hope is that we can change at least one life while we're here on this planet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And even so, while some of us share a lot of it, there are still some things that it takes a long time to be able to take that first step. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to trust the person you're telling too, even if it's being broadcast to a gazillion people, you still have to trust the interviewer, the person that you're going to tell that story to. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So your podcast journey has been really inspiring. And even though you're extremely good at business savvy, were you kind of surprised at how popular the label free podcast became right out of the gate? Yes. Yeah, very surprised. I got overwhelmed with people wanting to be on the show. And I still get at least 50 people a week that want to be on the show. I'm sure you're getting inundated too. That's a little onerous. (laughs) I decided to have my best friend. I told her what was going on. I was getting so overwhelmed and she's like, well, I'll help. And so she's been with me now for over a year and we've kind of grown it into something very different. And I'm actually getting ready to release her conversations with our guests as a segment of the show. And we're redacting people's names because her conversations get a little bit more in depth with people's stories. And they get, a lot of people get very emotional with her. You know, what it tells me about the popularity of the show is that there are so many people out there that feel held back. They feel held back by themselves. They feel held back by society. They feel held back by family. There are people that, my guests, that have overcome those feelings of being held back and have stepped into their purpose, stepped into their own voice, stepped into their passions. And that's really what we can only encourage people to do, right? Because the more people living in their purpose on this planet that are putting those good vibes out there and helping us all elevate at a higher consciousness, the better we are going to be together as a society because we've seen over the last couple of years, the amount of separation that happened amongst everyone was just unbelievable. I felt there was just an evil, an evil in the world. Like I just felt it so, it was just so toxic. And so for me, what I feel about doing my show is trying to Mm. kill that evil with good. And let's put, we are all we are all connected one way or the other. We all have similar stories and a story that we share could possibly save someone's life or help them re- or help them resolve an issue with a family member, resolve an issue with someone that they care about, resolve an issue with their husband. You know, and I think that is as people, public figure like yourself, our duty is to share those stories to help people kind of find their way. Wow. I love this so much. You have inspired the hell out of me just by- <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. Bye, 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 bye. <laughs> people want to be heard. People want to be seen. Yeah. And sometimes it's just a matter of hearing an interview or seeing a person on TV or on a show that they can, they can relate to. Yeah. And also if you look at people who have escaped toxic relationships, especially if there's a marriage certificate involved and children, I've been blessed that I have not had to worry about that side. I could just leave on on my side. Uh, This can be the most dangerous time for so many. And the fact of all the things that you've been through, do you feel that this right here, this right now, this freedom that you have now is a gift? Yes. Yeah. Very much so. I mean, it's been earned, obviously, but, you know, it, it... Yeah, it's definitely a gift for sure. Hard fought gift. (laughs) A hard fought gift. Yeah, there's days that, you know, I'm like, what am I doing? I've got three offers in the last two days, one for a vice president role, one for sales leadership role, one for like a contract to hire role in their very well-paid positions. But what I do today, it's like feast or famine. I have one week making a ton of money, one week where I'm not making any. And so it's just like my fiance 
God bless him. He's very supportive. He's like, I want you just to be happy. You're great at what you do. You love what you do. And so I appreciate having a partner like that. But there are days where it's just like, I question, like, should I continue to put everything into it? Should I continue to do it, go down this path? And there are things that happen that just re reaffirm my faith in the things that I'm doing. And I just have to believe that I'm bringing value and that value is going to ultimately generate the, what I need one way or the other. It's yeah. freedom <laughs> and the ch choice to choose and be and not take any of the positions or, or gigs that you want or have the steady income and the security. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have both. <laughs> well, if you can, but it's going to be very difficult to balance, you know, because I have yeah. done it before. So what's next for Deanna? What's next for me? Well, as you mentioned, I am the head coach and founding partner of the Female Podcasters Network. So I'm doing a lot of work there, just getting us to, getting us to grow. And we're going to be launching on Apple TV here soon. So I'm starting a show for us specifically, highlighting the women in our network mm -hmm. on their podcasting journey. And then as we grow with that, then we're going to be launching it on the Apple TV and we're selecting a group of women from the network to launch on that channel as well. So just a constantly looking to, if I can coach my ladies, that's how I get some income, but also I want to see them succeed. So really just kind of nurturing that business that I have there and working on it, just getting it to where I feel like it, I want it to be and continuing to put out great content to inspire the world. Thank you so much. And I'm so grateful you came on the show. Thank you for having me, Debbie. It was an honor.